Let's just pray together. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you so much um, for this opportunity just to come together today and to open your word. It's just my humble prayer that your spirit would be with us, that you would guide and lead and that we would see something of Jesus today. In your name, amen. <clears throat> I remember when I first started to <clears throat> date Brittany. Brittany was right into running at the time and uh, she was actually training up. I think she was going to do a half marathon and all that kind of thing. And so I thought to myself, you know, a really good way <clears throat> to, to impress her would, would be to do some running with her. You know, let's go for a run together and all of that kind of thing. And so... I said to Brittany, hey, you know, would you be interested in going for a run together? We can do that. And she said, yeah, that'd be awesome. And then she said, oh, what do you think? We'll run like 10 Ks. <clears throat> <laughs> you know, so I'm thinking to myself, um, that could be a problem. But I had been running a bit myself and I was training at the gym fairly, fairly regularly. And so I said to her, I tell you what, let's just do 5 Ks, you know. So she said, OK, we'll do 5 Ks. I'll meet you at your place. So. She met at my house, we ran from my house, which is right where I was living at the time, was at the Swing Bridge at Avondale College. There was this white house behind it that had like 50 million Avondale students living in it because it was so cheap to live there. So anyways, I was one of those students. So Brittany met me there and we started to run. <clears throat> we ran up the street called Victory Street. We ran down that main road, I don't even know what it's called, maybe it's called Freeman's Drive. Is it Freeman's Drive? That's what it's called. We ran down there. And then we're running towards uh, Avondale Memorial Church. And then we're going to go down the main street at Avondale College and then go all the way back through the swing bridge to that spot. So it's actually, it's like five or six Ks, something like that. <clears throat> now, first K, I mean, you should have seen me go. First K, I was very strong, you know, I was running very well. Um, we had no problems with the first K whatsoever. Second K was a fairly similar story. Third K, I was still doing pretty good. Third K, I was doing pretty good. I ran about the 4K mark. I can remember, actually, we're, we're kind of moving past Memorial Church. I ran about the 4K mark. I was on, let's say, well, I was starting to be on Struggle Street. Anybody been on Struggle Street whilst running before? I'm sure most of you can relate with me on that one. So 4Ks, you know, around about 4Ks, I'm starting to get on Struggle Street. Now, here's the problem. Brittany, she has no problems. Like, 4Ks, like, she's not even warmed up yet. So she's just still steaming along. And I'm thinking, oh, man. But, you know, the things you do for love, right, you just push through the pain. And so I just continued to run, run out as hard as I possibly could. 5Ks, I must have been on Struggle Street at 5Ks. Now, here's what, here's what happened at 5Ks. My friends are driving in their car. Yeah, I know, it was the worst. Anyways, my friends are driving in their car. My friends, they, they, they drive past us, and I hear them just hanging out the window like, ah. car full of guys, you know. Anyways, next day, <clears throat> I made it, by the way. Probably wasn't pretty by the end, but I made it. Um, the next day, I'm down near the theology section there at Avondale College, and I seen one of my friends. He, in fact, ended up marrying Brittany's sister. So, yeah, now we're brother-in-laws. But anyway, it was, it was him. It was him, and he sees me there and says, hey, man, how's it going? And we're having a little chat and all that kind of stuff. And then he says to me, he says, hey, you were running yesterday, hey? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, yeah, I was in the car, I was in the car. And then he said to me, you know, as we were coming down the road, <clears throat> And we were a little way off. You were going so slow, we thought you were Britney's dad. <laughs> I was devastated, you know. <clears throat> I was trying my best. As I reflect on the story, something comes to my mind, and that is this. If fitness, right, physical fitness, like, you know, when it comes to running or whether it's lifting weights or whatever it is that you enjoy to do, some people enjoy playing squash or tennis or whatever, swimming, if physical fitness is present, then physical fitness is present. You know, there's no way to hide that. Like, there's no way to kind of try and 
Make it look like you're super fit. I mean, you can put on all the clothes, you can put on the, the exercise equipment, etc. But if it's not there, it's just not there. That's the reality. Now, <clears throat> I also think about the spirit. I think about the spirit of God. And I would say that the, the, the very same principle applies. If the spirit of God is present in your life, if you're the kind of person that loves to connect with Jesus, if you're the kind of person that is a person of Bible study, a person of prayer, a person of service, a person who fellowships with other Christians, a person who kind of who, who puts themselves in a space where the Spirit of God can actually enter into their lives, if you're that kind of person, then the Spirit will be present. But the reality is, if you're not, then you're not. Now the problem comes when, the problem comes when those who are not become more than those who are in the context of church life. Does that make sense? Because what starts to happen then is our, our church that was supposed to be a church that was full of the Spirit of God, a church that was serving its community, a church that was making a difference, an impact for the kingdom of Jesus, that church, when, when, when the Spirit is, is not present within the people, the church starts to die. The church starts to experience that, that word we call Laodicea. The church starts to experience apathy and, 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 and lethargy and all those kinds of things. The reality is this. If the Spirit is present in our church, the Spirit is present. And we struggled with that. Now when I say we've struggled with that, I'm not simply talking into uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church. I'm certainly not talking straight here into Waitara Church because I've only been here once before, so I'm not really sure. What I'm talking about is, is the church in history. We've struggled with that. John chapter 17, <clears throat> 20 and 21. Notice what Jesus says. He's praying that, he's praying that famous prayer that we read in John chapter 17, and he says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me, through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. So here we have Jesus praying this prayer. Specifically, he's praying for his disciples. But he's not simply praying for his disciples. In fact, he's praying for those who his disciples will make disciples of. So in essence, you could apply that to us today. Jesus is praying for, for Christians, for disciples throughout time. And he says, hey, Father, can you make them one? Why? So that the world may believe that you sent me. Put the Spirit of God so fresh and so rich in the midst of the church in the midst of the people, that they love each other so much, so that, so that they're focused on the mission of Jesus, so that they're active in their community, so that people can see that you sent me. He prays for that. And we're going to ask ourselves, why is it that Jesus is praying for this? I want to flick to Luke chapter 22. This is just a little bit back in the story. So we take a step back in the story, and this is what we notice. Luke chapter 22, the text says, And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how they might betray him to them. Now I want you to catch something. This passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 22 is talking about the Last Supper. So as we're leading into the Last Supper, the Bible tells us that Satan enters into Judas. And then we continue. It gets worse. The disciples now are sitting around, they're having the Last Supper. It, 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 it literally is the last meal that Jesus will experience on earth before his death, before his crucifixion. And notice what happens. How rude are these guys? And, they're all, and there arose also a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. This is the disciples, right? It's the Last Supper, and the disciples decide 
This is a really good time to have a fight amongst each other as to who's the greatest. Now I want you to think about this here for a second. These guys, these guys have been with Jesus, some of them, for close to three years. We know the official calling of, 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 of the twelve was something that happened about one and a half years into Jesus' ministry. But we know that Jesus called some of the disciples fairly early. You read the book of John, you'll see Peter was called very early. And, 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 and here, even after they'd spent all this time with Jesus himself, they're still fighting about who's the greatest. That's, that's the church that Jesus has to deal with at present. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, I will build a church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And now he's looking at these guys that are going to be the leaders of this New Testament movement, of this New Testament church. He's been with them for nearly three years and they're fighting amongst each other. And then it gets worse. Simon, Simon, Jesus says at the Last Supper, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when you once have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied me three times that you know me. Now I want you to think about this here for a second. Peter often gets the bad rap. Peter gets the bad rap like he, he, he's the guy that denied Jesus. Paul, I want to say this. At least Peter stuck around long enough to have the opportunity to deny Jesus. John chapter 16, behold, an hour is coming, Jesus says, and already has come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone, and yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. If you read through the book of Matthew, I was reading through the book of Matthew this week, the disciples literally bolted on Jesus. They left him. So this is the church. This is the gathering. The ecclesia, the called out ones that, that, that God is looking to, to create a movement. But they're struggling. And we know they came good. The book of Acts tells us very simply that, very clearly, they came good. But the big question today is, are we good? Not in the righteous sense. I'm talking, you know, are, are, are we actually committed to Jesus in our lives? Are we spending that time with Him day in and day out? Are we allowing the Spirit of God to come freshly into our lives so we can be the church that He's called us to be? I want, the big question for us is, where are we at? Now are we willing to make a stand if we're not there? I want to talk about a church. <clears throat> today, I want to, today I want to talk about a church that brings life. Jesus said in John chapter 14, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Today I want to talk about a church that brings life, that is found in Jesus. We're going to start in 2 Kings. <clears throat> I've had the cold, so it was weeks ago, but you know when you, you keep coughing, right? So I'm going to keep drinking that water to keep me going here. Here we go. 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. This is a really weird passage of Scripture. If you read through the Bible, you'll find some really weird stories. This is a weird story. Here it goes. Elisha died, and they buried him. Now the bands of the Moabites would invade the land in the spring of the year. As they were burying a man, behold, they saw a marauding band, and they cast the man into the grave of Elisha. And when the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived... And stood up on his feet. That's strange, right? I want you to think about this for a second. This is absolutely strange stuff. Now, just, just, just for a second, put yourself in the picture. This is not in the text. I'm kind of making this up a little bit. But let's just, let's just think a little bit for a second here as we read the Bible, right? <clears throat> Here's the family. Let's say the guy's named Johnny. Sorry if your name's Johnny. I always just use Johnny. It's just that name I can use. So let's just say the guy, his name is Johnny, right? Johnny's passed away. The family's burying him. They call him Uncle Johnny or whatever. And as they're, you know, burying Uncle Johnny, they see these marauders. They're coming like robbers. 
And so they're absolutely worried. They just say, sorry, Uncle Johnny, we really do want, want this to be like that on your funeral day. They just chuck him straight there. This is what's happening, right? Straight there into the tomb of Elisha. Then he touches the bones of Elisha and he comes to life. Now, now, what's Uncle Johnny going to do? I mean, he wakes up, right? He's probably looking around thinking, man, what on earth is happening out, out, out here? I wonder what happens when he's seen the robbers coming. I wonder what happened when the family's seen Uncle Johnny. Would you run from the robbers or would you run from him? You know what I'm saying, right? This is a really, why am I saying all this stuff? Because this is a really strange story. Sometimes it's really important that when we read the text of Scripture that we actually look at it, that we actually think about it, that we actually ask these questions. What? What's happening here? <clears throat> here we have it. Elisha, this is the point that I want to make. Elisha brought life even when he was dead. Now we know God is the one who brought life. But what I'm trying to say is this, God had worked so powerfully through Elisha's life. God had been so active and so present that even once Elisha was gone, his bones were doing miracles. And, and, and now the question that comes to my mind is, what was Elisha like? What was, like, what was Elisha like as a person that even when he was dead, his bones were, were, were making all of these crazy miracles? What was he like? <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 2. If you go back to 1 Kings, you'll see the story where you'll see the story where Elijah the prophet he comes to Elisha. He's plowing in the field. And as he's plowing in the field, he basically calls him to prophetic ministry, throws his mantle on him, calls him into the prophetic ministry. Elisha responds and says, hey, I just want to say, see it to my parents first. And Elijah, I imagine he's probably got some kind of guilt happening. He's saying, oh man, what have I called you to? I mean, he's already been through that horrendous ordeal on Mount Carmel. He's experienced hate from an entire nation. And now he's come and he said to this young man, you know, basically he's called this young man into, into prophetic ministry. And Elisha says, I just want to say goodbye to my parents. And I imagine Elijah the prophet is kind of going, oh, what have I done to this poor young man? He says, go back. Elisha does go back. But what he does when he goes back is, 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 is really interesting. He goes back and then he, he burns all his stuff and then he heads out his, his work stuff is what I'm talking about, like his his oxen and the plow and all of that kind of thing. He burns it and then he heads out on the journey with Elijah the prophet. And so here he is now. He's on the journey with Elijah the prophet, doing ministry as an apprentice prophet, you could say, for a number of years. And then it comes that time. It comes that time when Elijah is about to ascend to heaven and he, and he asks Elisha this question. He says, hey, what can I do for you? Elijah knows that God has called him back and he says, what can I do for you? And here's what he says. He says, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Notice how Elijah responds. It's very interesting. He said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. He says, hey, you've really asked for something difficult here today. Now that to me makes a whole lot of sense because I want you to capture Elijah the prophet filled with the Spirit in full swing. I mentioned Mount Carmel a second ago. Think about him here for a second on Mount Carmel, right? He's up on top of Mount Carmel. There are 850 false prophets up there. If you read the story, there are actually the prophets of Baal, which were false prophets, and there, there, were, there was another group. There's like 850 false prophets up there. There was the entire, or at least a good portion of Israelite people gathered there on the mountain. Then there's the king, of course, and, 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 and Elijah the prophet, he stands there in the midst of these people that hate him. Because he seemed to be the one who brought drought upon the people. So he stands there in the midst of these people that hate him. And as he stands there in the midst of these people, he calls the prophets of Baal out. And he says, hey, let's do a little experiment. We're going to put some, well, I'm going to make an offering. 
See if my God can burn it with fire from heaven. You make one. Let's see if your God can do it. And so the prophets of Baal, they come out, right? And we know the story. They, they, they dance around all day like crazy people trying to make something happen to this, to this offering. They're cutting themselves and all kinds of ridiculous things. They're doing it all. And Elijah the prophet, he just stands there. And as he's standing there, he's watching. Then he stands back. He says, God, the fire comes from heaven. It consumes the offering that Elijah has prepared. Now, if you read the story, right, he drenched it with water, he drenched it with water, he drenched it with water, and God still consumed this thing. And I've actually been to the place where they reckon Mount, Mount Carmel is. <clears throat> and, and, and it's very interesting. <clears throat> you would have been able to see, you would have been able to see this feet of God for miles around. Mount Carmel kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. So you would have been able to see fire come from heaven from, 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 from miles around. God stands up and says, hey, I'm God. And Elijah goes out and he prays beside the mountain. He sees a small little cloud out there in the midst. And he knows that rain is coming. He knows that rain is coming and so he makes his way back. And then we see in the story that he runs beside the chariots and he runs faster than the chariots, the Bible says. And if you do the mass on the geography, it's for something like 30 Ks. Faster than the chariots. So I want you to think about this here for a second. This is Elijah the prophet in full swing. He's calling fire from heaven. He's praying for rain and rain comes. When he runs, he outruns chariots. Not for 1K, not for 2K, but for 30Ks. Why? Because he is so filled with the Spirit of God. He's considered to be the greatest prophet since the time of Moses. Elijah was absolutely filled with the Spirit of God. And Elisha the prophet comes along and says, Hey, I want double what you have. Did you catch that back in the text? Please let a what? Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And then Elijah responds and he says, you have asked a hard thing. You're asking for a whole lot of Holy Spirit. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven what does the text say? Elisha saw it. What does that mean? That means he gets that spirit. That was the deal, right? When I go up, if you see me, you get the spirit. In fact, you get a double portion of the spirit. And so, 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 so here's the point that I'm trying to make. Elisha was one spirit-filled prophet. In fact, you see it in the next text. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho opposite him saw him, they said... The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him. And what did they do? And they bowed themselves to the ground before him. Now, this is not worship. This is not worship in any way, shape, or form. This is simply respect. They know the kind of spirit that, that was part of Elijah. Now they say, hey, this is resting on the prophet Elisha. And as they see him coming, just in respect for this man of God, they just bow. He was filled with the Spirit of God. So much so that when he was walking along one day and the young people started to make fun of him, what happened? Bears came out, the Bible tells us, and mauled them. Because he was a man of God, filled with the Spirit of God. Now, if you follow, if you follow his story, what you'll notice is Elisha the prophet was a life work, a life miracle working machine. You read throughout his stories, he does something like 20 plus miracles. He is just literally going from place to place, filled with the Spirit of God, bringing life. From place to place, bringing life. And so the question, the question I have for us as a church today, are we a church that brings life? Are we a church that brings life? I'm not talking about going down to Sydney Adventist Hospital and raising people from the dead. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the person who lives down the street just here. 
that's got some serious addictions, that's struggling with issues in their life. I'm talking about the, the people who are in your workplace and, and, and you know that they've got a serious problem with pride. You can, see how it's, you can see how it's affecting the way they work. You can see how it's affecting the people that they, they have close relationships with. They're absolutely struggling. I'm talking about the people in our city, the people in our community who don't have money, who don't have food, who, who don't have the, 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 the very basic things that we have. I'm talking about the people who are fleeing to our country just hoping for a better life. And I'm asking the question, how much compassion do we have for these people? How much, how much of the heart of Jesus do we have for these people? How many people are we bringing life to? That's the question. And one of the reasons I ask this question is because as Adventists, here's what we're really good at. I kind of think of like a triangle. I want you guys to think about a triangle here for a second. This is something that I've noticed. We've got this triangle. If you, were to, if you were to divide the triangle up, let's say we divide it up into like three different pieces. What we often do is we spend a whole lot of time up here in this top section where we're talking about, you know, theological issues and, and social issues and, and all that kind of stuff. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about these things. I mean, it's so important that we study the scriptures, that we have an understanding of the Bible, that we have an understanding of current issues and things that are going on. Sure, that's important. But you know, in the funnel, right, we spend so much time up here. And then if we move down the funnel, then we start talking about a lot of the stuff that's happening at, at, at church. But so often, the stuff that we're talking about that's happening at church is all about what we're doing. And oftentimes, it's for us. And this is the part that drives me crazy. Then we get down to this bottom little section of the triangle. That's where the people who are hurting are at. That's where the people who need Jesus are at. That's where the people who don't have food and don't have, and don't have money or, or, or the people who are addicted to drugs or the people who are suicidal or the people who are just struggling in all sorts of different ways. That's where they're at. And, 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 and for some reason, so often that little space doesn't get much attention. For some reason, we're not, we're not active in, in the spaces where we need to be sharing the gospel of Jesus. We've been called to do that. You know that famous quote by Alan White, right? We've been called to minister to the people's needs before we call them to follow Jesus. But so often... The reason I'm saying this, friends, is because Facebook makes it very apparent. So often, right, we, you watch these Facebook threads, threads between Adventists. I don't know how on earth they have so much time to argue about so many things. You know, like, and, and the thing about it as well that drives me crazy is that we have so badly left behind the Matthew 18 principle. Like that principle where if you've got a problem with a, friend, with, with a brother or a sister, you actually go and you speak to them face to face and then you bring somebody with you if it's not working out and then you tell it to the church if it's, not, if it's still not, not working out. But so often we just totally neglected that thing and here's what we do. We jump onto Facebook for hours and we just slander each other like there's no tomorrow. And I wonder, what do people think about us? Because I see it in the threads. Like people say, yeah, as evidence, we do this, that, and then yeah, yeah, but you're this, and you're that, and yeah, but you're this. And I'm thinking to myself, what do people think about us? Now, look, I don't mind. I don't mind if we discuss hard issues. I think it's, I think it's valuable to discuss hard issues. I think it's valuable to pull out the Bible and, 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 and talk these things through together. But what happens when that's all, what happens when that gets the majority of our time? And the 5.6 million people in Greater Sydney don't get much. Do you know that according to McCrindle Research Group, according to McCrindle Research Group, 7% of Australians are active practices of faith. 7%. They say that 45% of, of Australians adhere to a Christian faith, 15% go to church once a month, 7% are active practices of faith. What they consider as active practices of faith are people who are act actively engaged in a church community week to week. Now, I don't know, I didn't do the research, but that's what they're saying. And the reality is, when I look around at the community, when I look around at, at, at people that are surrounding us, 
Sometimes in my mind I'm thinking, you know what, maybe they're not so far off. I honestly believe that in this space there are millions of people that we can reach for Jesus. We can share life with them. I was going to tell you a story, but I don't want to keep you too long. Life-sharing people. If we become life-sharing people, individually, then we will become a life-sharing church. And that's what counts. That's what that whole message, Revelation 14, verse 6 to 12, is about. It's about the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ. Calling people to respond to God in worship. That's what the whole thing is about. Sharing the goodness of Jesus. So here it is. What do life-sharing people do? Life-sharing people, number one, they commit to Jesus and they don't look back. I'm pulling these lessons from the life of Elisha. Even when he was dead, his bones were doing crazy things. So, so I think that we can learn some lessons from this guy. Life-sharing people look to Jesus and they don't look back. 1 Kings 19, 21. He returned from following him. He took the pair of oxen. I've reflected on this story already. He sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. Elijah comes into the life of Elisha and says, I want to call you to prophetic ministry. Here's what Elisha the prophet does. He goes back and he literally burns the instruments that he uses for livelihood. So if we think about that here for a second, say you own a shop like a business, like there's a mower shop down the street from my house. Sorry if you actually own it. But just think about this here for a second. Imagine if God came along one day and called you into full-time ministry and, and, and you went back and literally burnt the shop down. Like you burnt your livelihood down. Well, this is what Elisha done. He committed to Jesus and he did not look back. But see, he, here's the thing. So often in our, in our spiritual experience, this is what we do. We're, we're looking to Jesus and we're so excited about the fact that Jesus is pulling us out of the, the, these things that are in our life. And then what, what happens is we start to get on this plane where we're doing okay with Jesus. And life is kind of cleaned up. And we're attending church regularly and we're getting into the swing of things and all that type of stuff. But after a few years go by, it's so tempting, it's so easy to start looking around. And you're thinking to yourself, you know what, before I was a Christian, I could have just made that one dodgy business deal. Could have made it. Oh, before I was a Christian, I could have had that chat with that lady and it would have been fun and, you know, it, would have, you know, it wouldn't have been a big deal. It would have been no problem. I could have watched that TV show. I could have listened to that tune or I could have done this or I could have done that or I could have been, you know, and we start to kind of look back. We start to look back at the things that we once enjoyed before and we start to think that maybe we're missing out on something again. We forget the depths that Jesus pulled us up and out of. And we don't realize if we get back to where we were, we're just going straight back down again. Because in Jesus' life, Elisha didn't look back. <clears throat> and he was a life-giving machine. Number two, life-sharing people ask God to humbly teach them. This passage here really makes me think. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 11. Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who used to catch this, pour water on the hands of Elijah. Now, I've done an apprenticeship. I did an apprenticeship as a plumber, and then I worked in that industry. Now, I can tell you this. If my boss, when I was an apprentice, came along to me at Smoko time and said, put his hands out ready for me to wash them, I think he would have got a fairly rude response. You know what I'm saying, right? Now, let's think about this here for a second. At your workplace, at your workplace or, or whatever, the person who's kind of above you, what would happen if at, lunch, if, if at lunchtime they came along and they put their hands out ready for you to wash them? I would think that person's crazy. But here we see... I, I, Elisha was happy to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Notice what Ellen White says about it. She says, it was no great work that was at first required of Elisha. 
commonplace duties still constituted his discipline. He is spoken of as pouring water on the hands of Elijah, his master. He was willing to do anything that the Lord directed. And at every step, he learned lessons of humility and service. Life-sharing people live with humility. So they make this, there's, there's a flow here, right? They make this commitment to Jesus and they say to themselves, you know what, Jesus, I don't want to look back. I want to make a commitment to you, Jesus, and I want to look forward. I want to move forward. But what we need to do to move forward is we need to have humility. Humility is absolutely essential to move forward because here's the thing, that there's things in our life that God doesn't want in our life. But if we don't have humility, we will not admit that those things are in our life. So when God's coming into our space and he's saying, hey, I don't like the way that you're talking to your spouse. Hey, I don't like the way that you're acting up at work. Hey, I don't like the words that you're speaking. Hey, I'm not real keen on the way that you're spending your money and, and, and where you're spending your money. If we don't have humility, we will not respond to the Spirit of God. There's a progression. Number one. Commit to Jesus and don't look back. But number two, if we're going to move forward, we need to have humility. Life-sharing people commit to Jesus and they don't look back. Life-sharing people ask God to humbly teach them. Life-sharing people ask God to fill them with what matters most. Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Think about this here for a second. This guy's a young man. He could have asked for a fancy chariot. I was going to say a fancy car, but they didn't have fancy cars back then, right? He could have asked for that beautiful wife. Because Elijah said to him, Hey, Elisha, I'm, I'm out of here. What can I give you? He could ask for a whole range of things. But he says, just give me the Holy Spirit. Give me the Holy Spirit. Because I'm committed, I'm not looking back. The Spirit is keeping me humble to move forward. Give me some more of that Spirit so I can keep moving forward. So I can share life. Friends, nothing else matters more. Like when you think, like when you... When you, when you honestly think about it, what else matters more than life? What else matters more than eternity? You remember this? On the Sydney Harbour Bridge? I was going to tell you the story about this, but I'm going to tell you a different story instead. But I wanted to show you this again because yesterday when I was driving out of the Sydney Adventist Hospital, I looked to the left and there's a pole down there in the car park where somebody's written this beautiful word, Eternity. Maybe you'll have to look at the story when you get home. But I do want to say this. Nothing matters more than eternity. Nothing. So here here we are. Last year. I gave my granddad a call one day. At the time he had pancreatic cancer. I said to him, hey, Grindon, how you doing? We start to have a chat. Now, before I tell you how he responded, before I tell you how he responded, I want to just rewind a little bit. I want you to have a little bit of an insight into my granddad. So my granddad didn't grow up in a church family. His wife grew up going to Sunday school, my nana. So when he was about late 30s, he was a drunk. He was a car salesman. He'd go out, drink at night, come home. Kick the dog, literally. You know, and so my nana, because she went to Sunday school as a kid, she knew to pray, so she prayed. She asked God if he was present, if he existed, to help. Two weeks later, there's a knock at the door. It's that local Adventist pastor offering Bible studies. My nana seen it as an answer to prayer, and she said, sure. So she started to do Bible studies with this local Adventist pastor. My granddad's probably thinking, man, who's this guy coming around my house every week trying to hang out with my wife, you know, like. Um, <clears throat> eventually, my nana wanted to go to church. So 
my granddad had to drive her because she didn't have a license. So he would drive her to church and he told me this story. Literally, he would park at the front and then he would like slouch in his seat. Hiding because he didn't want his drinking friends to know that he was at church. <clears throat> so he hid. But the Adventists, they like people who hide in the cars. So they come down every time after church, they start to talk to my granddad. So maybe we need to check the car park after, I don't know, I'm just saying, right? So he, he, he would come down, he would talk to my granddad, and six months or so later, I think my nana got baptised. I'm pretty sure my mum did as well at the same time, she would have been like a teenager then. <clears throat> a year or so later, my granddad got baptised. So he was 40 years of age when he, when he joined the Adventist church, when he gave his heart to Jesus. And then he began his journey. And he was a dodgy guy before. He was a dodgy guy before. In fact, there was a story told about him one time. He was a car salesman, right? He drove this car up into a, a uh, mechanic shop. And when he drove it up onto the ramp, he went too far. And he hit the bricks on the end and some of them fell on the bonnet. The mechanic who was there told us as kids, he told us this story about our granddad, what it used to be like. So anyways, my granddad, he gets out of the car, he's got this big smile on his face. He grabs a brick and he starts to scratch up the other areas of the car. Like serious, he's a car salesman, right? He'd also sold insurance. And, and, and everyone's looking at him like, what the hell are you doing? And he smiles at him, he says, hey, if insurance is going to paint the front, they might as well paint the whole thing. <laughs> serious, this is what he was like. He fast forward 40 years. He's given his life to Jesus. And I called him up on the phone. <clears throat> Two weeks later, he would pass away. That's the last time I spoke to him. I said, Grenad, how you going? <clears throat> He's a very funny guy. He used to love and joke, uh, joke all the time. So in a very jokingly way, he says, well, I'm going okay, but I am dying after all. You know, so I started laughing at him a little bit. And he's laughing as well on the other end, as best as, as, as he could. And he said to me, but son, I'm not worried. He quoted me, 1 Thessalonians, that the dead in Christ will rise first. He said, hey, I'm going to beat you there. <laughs> and he said, I'll see you there. It's the last time I spoke to my granddad, he said, I'll see you there, son. So I want to say this, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> nothing matters more than eternal life that we find in Jesus. And so people, we've got, we've, got, we've got all of these things to be activists about today. Have you guys noticed that? There's about three million things that you can be an activist for. And some of them are important. Don't get me wrong. <clears throat> some of them are absolutely valuable. But here's what I tell young people. The most important thing that you can be an activist for is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the most important thing that you can be an activist for. And so you can go out doing this and doing that and doing that. But if you're not being an activist for Jesus... If you're not asking the Spirit of God to come fresh into your life every day, to be part of your journey, to guide you and lead you and to help you to share Jesus. Where are you going? What are you doing? You've been called to share life. Let us pray together. <clears throat> Father in heaven, We've been called to share life as a church. As we come together today, we've been able to open your word. We've been able to feel your spirit. Call us back into focus. Lord, I've been able to feel your spirit call me back into focus as I share these words. As I reflected on this message, I know there's things in my life where you're saying, that's got to go. We want to move forward. I want you to radiate the presence of Jesus more in your life. And so, Lord, I just pray for each and every person that's gathered here today. I pray for this church. And I ask, Lord, as we pray together that people will make a decision for you. There's got to be someone out here that's just thinking, man, I need to commit to Jesus. Maybe it's the first time, maybe it's Maybe it's that they've been committed to Jesus, but sometimes we just get a little bit sidetracked the, and they're thinking, you know what, I need, to, I 
need to recommit. I need to recommit to Jesus. I need to let him come in. So Father, I just pray that you would help us. Help us as a church. Help us as a community. Help us to make those decisions today for you. Help us to start fresh so that we can share the way, the truth, and the life with the people that surround us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.